All right. Well, while we wait for a few more folks, I do want to introduce um, what Suitcase is. We know this is a new program for many of you who are not local here in New England, um, but you may be in New England and still not be aware of it. So Suitcase Stories is a program of the International Institute of New England. The International Institute of New England is one of the oldest nonprofit organizations serving refugees and um, immigrants in the area. We are over 100 years old and we provide like many immigrant and refugee organizations a continuum of services. We are one of the agencies resettling refugees in greater Boston and Lowell, Massachusetts and in southern New Hampshire. We also offer English instruction, employment services, legal services, um, as well as our suitcase stories program. Now my background is I'm from Maine where I um, entered the refugee and immigrant field. My, my backstory is that I studied at Clark University and I was interested in forced migration and refugee studies, but I never imagined that shortly after graduating college, 5,000 Somali immigrants would move into my hometown in Maine and essentially change my life forever. And, among, and I spent the last 20 years working in the field, but in particular, I've become really fascinated and realized the importance of stories and sharing them and diversifying the narrative, if you will. And so a few years ago in 2000, and, um, after the election in 2017, the International Institute launched Suitcase Stories as a way to address the negative rhetoric aimed at immigrants, but also really to raise the profile of refugee and immigrant stories. Um, and it's often told by US and foreign born um, people because all of us, all of us, in my opinion, have a suitcase story. Whether you have traveled to a new country, whether you have moved to a new country, whether you have been friends with, relatives of, interacted with, coworkers, people from other nationalities, all of these experiences shape who we are. And so the International Institute decided to create this program to feature these stories in a number of ways. Um, very quickly, we offer showcases like this where people have identified stories from their lives, they've crafted them, they've rehearsed them, and then they deliver them either on stage or virtually. We also have a program called Suitcase Stories Unpacked, where we teach the art of storytelling through the lens of migration. We do this in companies and schools and nonprofits. It's a lot of fun. And then we have virtual programs right now. But I could go on and on, but I would really want to is get to the stories, of course. So tonight, the, or, the, the, the structure is going to be that we are going to settle in in a second and listen to four stories that have been re recorded. We didn't know how tech might go, so we've recorded the stories in advance. We're going to hear from four people, someone who was born in Cuba, in Bosnia, in Zimbabwe, and in Syria. And then they will join us live online tonight to answer your questions and hear from you about what their stories meant to you, what you could relate to, what resonated with you. So please keep in mind as you're hearing the stories, the questions you might like to pose. And again, you can put those in the Q&A at any point and I'll make sure to get deliver them to the storytellers um, afterwards. But you also can just send them love. I know it takes a lot of bravery to share your lives with others. So if there's something about the story, you just wanna say thank you Put that there too because they can see those comments in the Q&A. I also want to say a huge thank you to the Refugee in Towns Project for putting on this conference and this festival and inviting us to be part of it. For as I often say when I talk about suitcase stories, for me for a long time I was all about policy and speeches and training and all of that is so important but I underestimated the importance of arts and storytelling and all of this and really have found that it's critical when we talk about social integration. But We'll get to that in the Q&A, but for now, I don't want to wait much longer to have you hear these stories. I'm going to briefly describe um, who our storytellers are, but really have you meet them in person in about 45 minutes. So our first storyteller, I consider a good friend. Um, her name is Anna Ibloff Blaster. She's a resident of Lexington, Massachusetts. She is a Cuban American writer. She has been featured in NPR, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, she is currently very close to finishing and publishing her first memoir about her life, relocating from Cuba, growing up in New England, and all the stories of integration and experiences captured therein. She's going to give you a teaser with her story tonight, so you'll have a preview, but I really encourage you when the book is out, to please look her up. But in the meantime, you can find her online and I'll make sure to share her website for those of you that want to explore. Our second teller is Voya Georgic. He was born in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He came to the United States about 20 years ago and began a new life uh, with some wonderful antics, uh, but has gone on to be incredibly successful here in the United States. He owns, a, he is CEO of Sigma Pro's company, 
but also a, devote activists around arts. He is very active in producing arts related events for um, um, Balkan, for music, for painting, for writing, for musicians, filmmaking. He even uses his office to have performances. Like I'm very excited, I've enjoyed getting to know him and you will find his story unique and entertaining. Our third teller is really, she woke up in the middle of the night to be with us. She was here with us all day at the Refugee Integration Conference. I hope took a nap, um, but she is uh, awake and ready to talk to you at 2 a.m. from Zimbabwe. Uh, Natasha Venerables is uh, from Zimbabwe. She recently completed her Master's in Peace and Conflict Studies. She's recently returned to her home country to contribute to the reconciliation. And what she's interested in and talked about today during the conference and we'll talk tonight about is what is finding home? Like, what does it mean? It's not enough to just go home. Finding home is a different um, process. And finally, our last storyteller is someone very special to me. Her name is Zainab Abdo. She is a resident of Lowell, Massachusetts. I had the privilege of meeting her on her second day in the United States. She was resettled by the International Institute with her family from Syria via Turkey. And when I met Zainab, I didn't know any Arabic. She knew very little English. We relied a lot on Google Translate, mistakes and all. But in the last four years, she is now fluent in English. And when I asked her if she wanted to share her story shortly after the um, travel ban, because we had so many reporters calling her office, she immediately said yes. She says, I don't want people to think of Syrians as terrorists. I want people to know that we have families, we care about the same issues as you. And so she started being interviewed by the New York Times, Chicago Tribune. She was featured on Al Jazeera and BBC. And then finally offered to tell her suitcase story for the first time in Boston in 2018. 18 months after coming into the United States, she stood on stage in front of 300 people and in English told her story. Since then, for me, her story just gets richer and richer because my Arabic has not improved, but her English has. And tonight you'll hear an even ro more robust version of her story because now, as you will hear, she is fluent. So with all that said, Thank you for listening. These stories are important and they're, they always need an audience. So I say cheers to the conference. I say cheers to you. I am now gonna turn it over to the stories. Thank you. I'm here to tell you my own story. When the sirens go, for some time I had everything I dreamed of. I have seven brothers. In four and a half months, 4,000 bombs were dropped on my seat. Two died in the bomb. Two were kidnapped. Three escaped. Have any choice other than fleeing Iraq? Every day, every night, our gunshots. My mom always used to say, "If we go, we go together, as a family." Mom told me that we were going to America. That we, we we got our visas. You look just like my mother. And she says, "Honey, I need you to sue the president of the United States." <laughs> And abandoned desire. 24 years later, I'm relocated in Lowell. To a great country called the United States of America. Chasing my dreams as a nurse. Helping my children with their homework, driving, and I'm happy. Thank you. It's November 1967. I'm almost six years old, living in Juanelo, Cuba, a barrio on the outskirts of Havana. It's a working class barrio. 
I have four generations of both sides of my family living all around me. In the barrio, nobody closes her windows or doors. Everybody knows everybody's business. Um, and some people even work together. My father and my uncles work at a canning factory down by the river. My mother and my aunt teach at a school around the corner. Um, and while the adults are working, the abuelas, the grandmothers, watch over us from their porches and their rocking chairs, and they don't miss a thing. Even if you start to think of something bad, they show up. But something weird is happening in the barrio, and I don't know what it is, how to explain it. Every now and then, it seems to me, a family disappears overnight. Um, I'll go in the morning and walk by a friend's house and they're gone. There's nobody in the house. The house is locked up tight. There's a banner across the, the door that seems to seal it shut. When I ask the adults what's going on, they say things like, they flew away to Florida, but I don't know what Florida is. How could someone fly away anyway? I don't understand any of it. Um, so I, I just keep asking questions, but kid, nobody ever answers kids really thoroughly. Um, so I, um, I, I didn't understand any of that, but I do did know that somehow the sound of a motorcycle coming into the neighborhood, into the barrio, was linked to those disappearances. So I knew that when I heard that, uh, there would be something going down the next day. What I didn't know was that my parents had actually applied for permission to leave the country and that they'd been waiting for three years without knowing if or when uh, the permiso would come. The permiso is what we called the exit papers. Um, parents had supported the revolution during the 50s, but when Castro's government um, took control, instead of the restored democracy that they'd been promised, they got ration books, repression. They saw lots of good people thrown in jail for criticizing the government, and they saw executions on live TV. So they had to get out of Cuba. They had to get their young family out of Cuba. But to do that now, you had to apply for permission from the new government because for the first time, Cubans were no longer free to leave their country. They had to ask permission from the government. So my parents did that and they immediately lost their jobs. And they knew that if and when that permiso came, they would lose every, have to leave behind everything that they owned but they didn't know him that much. So it wasn't a huge deal. And what did bother them, what scared them, was the notion of never seeing their family and lifelong neighborhood uh, friends um, again. But I didn't know any of that. I was just a clueless six-year-old uh, running around, playing in my abuela Cuca's yard, my grandmother Cuca, who lived down the street from us. Uh, every day I went there after school and I would, um, she had these skinny hens that I liked to chase and I, I tormented those poor creatures. Um, one day I was there around dinner time and I heard the motorcycle coming into the barrio and I needed to, I, I was so nosy, I had to figure out what was happening. So I um, ran through the gate, down the street and around the corner and I saw in front of my house a huge mob of people and near the sidewalk was the motorcycle. Um, huge motorcycle. Inside, my father was sitting at the kitchen table, his head in his hands. Uh, the, the table was set for dinner, which we, a dinner we never had. Um, my father was answering questions uh, that a guard in, in a uniform, in uniform was asking him, but my father never looked up. He kept answering, but never looked up. Behind the guard was my mother running around packing the one suitcase we would be allowed to take with us which I think got a change of clothes um, and an extra pair of shoes. Uh, behind, next to my, the, the guard was my grandmother, Fina, the, the grandmother who lived with us. And she was holding my baby brother in a death grip, shaking and crying. I ran to her and then all three of us were shaking and crying. And that's when the guard noticed me and he called me over. Niña, ven acá, little girl, come here. 
I went and he said, is it true that you don't, you you want to leave your neighborhood and your school and your friends and never see them again? And before I could answer, my my grandmother and father and mother all yelled, see, 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 a yucky itty, a yucky itty. In no time we were out on the street and I remember the guard close, locking the door and, and sealing it shut with a banner, the same banner that I had seen on all those other houses. And years later, I learned that the banner read property of the revolution. He gave my father papers and said, be at the airstrip tomorrow night at 8 p.m. That night, we slept at my uncle's house um, right above us. And um, everyone came to say goodbye during the night and in the morning too, uh, during the next day. My great grandfather was there, lots of relatives. And, uh, and my first grade teacher showed up. I loved her, uh, but I didn't know what to do with her in that setting. I was embarrassed, afraid, I don't know what it was. I, I ran and hid in um, a bedroom. My mother found me and said, Anita, your teacher was very, very brave to come here to the house of a Gusano family. Gusano means worm, and that's what the government called people like us who were trying to leave the country, worms. So mommy said, um, your teacher was very brave. She made herself brave. Ponte guapa, make yourself brave. Like your teacher made herself brave and go and say goodbye. I stood in front of my teacher, couldn't look at her face, stared at her shoes, finally looked up and tears were just running down her cheeks and every bit of emotion and fear and confusion that I had just exploded in sobs out of me and it felt, the release of it felt like I was lifting off the ground and floating through the air. Um, the next night we showed up at the airstrip, there were 200 other gusanos and gusanitos there um, for the, the processing of leaving the next day. And uh, like the other gusanitos, we were having a blast. We were running, we were all in our best clothes, but we were running around, uh, rolling on the dirty floor, and we were filthy in no time. Um, but then it, we got hungry, and there was nothing to eat, and we were thirsty, and there was nothing to drink. Um, sleepy, nowhere to sleep. We all kind of fell asleep on top of each other in little bunches. And I remember all that night, um, over the loudspeakers, these voices coming out and calling out names. Uh, the government was interrogating people and all through the night um, and threatening them with why they wouldn't be able to leave the next day with their family. That was the fear. They were just harassing them to the very end. Um, but we did get out. The next morning we sat, um, I sat, I remember that plane and how excited I was. And I remember the attendant right before we took off, walked down the aisle and, and, and sprayed us as she walked. Um, I remember the spray in my face and I, I think it was um, disinfectant, I don't know, but it must have felt like a slap to everyone on that, on that plane. The next two days we spent in a refugee center on the outskirts of um, Miami. They gave us hats, boots, coats, put us on a plane, and we ended up somehow in Nashville, New Hampshire. But I was fascinated because there was snow everywhere and the snow banks went up over my head and icicles that were just the coolest looking things hanging from roofs. Um, and I had a new teacher to love. And um, at night, when the adults came back from their new jobs at a rubber boot factory down by the Nashua River, we all gathered around the TV and learned English by watching Gilligan's Island and Star Trek, but we couldn't say Star Trek. So we called it Los Orejones, the big-eared ones. That was our favorite show. Um, but something wasn't right here either. Something was, there was a mystery here for me too. I would find my mother in her bedroom, lights out, um, crying. And she would say that it was a headache or a backache. I would run, um, and get an aspirin and give it to her. And I knew though that 
the aspirin wasn't going to take away whatever it was because I knew it wasn't a headache or a backache. Even kids could tell that that was a lie. Um, and my grandmother never stopped crying from the moment she woke up until the moment she went to sleep. And we slept together like we had in Cuba. Uh, at, at night, I would put my arm around her and she would sob and I would, we would fall asleep like that. Uh, and I had my own problems because for the first and the only time in my life, I, I had, um, I was hearing voices and I knew that only I could hear these voices. They came at night as I was trying to fall asleep or if I woke up in the middle of the night and I didn't, I didn't want to tell anyone about it. I knew that it, it, it was a strange thing. The voices came, started soft and got louder and they sounded metallic to me and I couldn't understand what they were saying. And they just crashed in my head and got louder and I would cover my ears, but I could still hear them. Um, and I never told anyone that. I, 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 not, not one person. And I think that now when I think about that time, I think I was trying to be brave. I think I was trying to make myself brave. Um, the one thing that brought happiness to everyone was when we would get a letter from one of the old women in the in the barrio, and the, those women never forgot us, and the old women here never forgot them. The letters went back and forth for more than fifty years, uh, and you know the the their letters never had a lot of information. Sometimes someone had passed away. Um, sometimes sometimes a baby would be born. Uh, gossip, uh, something funny that happened at at the bus stop. Um, but they, they were just the most beautiful connection to home. And for me, now that I have them, they're mine. And they are, when you touch them, they're as soft as a Kleenex. From all the time, times that people have opened the letters and folded them again. And uh, I, I love to look at them. And when I read them, I, I hear a an unwritten message in every line of every letter that I think those women were sending us. Ponte guapa, make yourself brave. My name is Wojciech Georgic. I was born in 1972 in Sarajevo. When I was 20 years old, the war in Bosnia escalated to the point of no return, creating death destruction and thousands of refugees, and I was one of them. After moving around from town to town, I finally settled in Bar, a small town in Montenegro where I met my wife, Daniela, also a refugee from Bosnia. Five years later, we were a married couple and our immigration visa to the United States was approved. Flight from Belgrade to Rome was my first time flying. I remember the plane was full of smoke, Half of the plane was designated as smoking section and my seat was there. On our next flight from Rome to New York City, I was excited and I, and I couldn't sleep. It didn't take me too long to figure out that the scotch was free. And by the time we arrived, I was relaxed and slightly drunk. It was late evening when we landed at Logan. When I stepped outside, the air smell of the ocean mist and the shuttle bus exhaust fumes. That is how freedom smells to me even today. With $1,300 in savings, my priority was to find a job as soon as possible and to learn English at the same time. About a week later, my case manager, Sasha, takes me to a job interview at 161 Devonshire Street. With the promise to improve my English, I was offered a job at the headquarters of the big real estate investment company. It was a minimum wage job with the formal dress code, suit and tie, but plenty of overtime available. My duties included sorting and delivering mail on three floors to over 200 employees, making fresh coffees twice a day at six kitchens and my special overtime assignment. 
making backup copies of all corporate documents sent to a safe storage facility. It's hard to believe what kind of documents you can have in your hands as the lowest paid employee. From financial statements to performance reviews and everything in between. It was a privilege and the opportunity to understand how the corporate world is structured. Since smokers are easy to socialize with, I took every opportunity to join my co-workers to take cigarette breaks. It was not healthy, but it was a very effective way to practice my English. After 10 months, I was ready to apply for a position where my language skills will improve even more. My friend Farouk, also a refugee from Bosnia, referred me for a front desk position at the hotel in downtown. Soon after, I was making dinner reservations and recommending sites to visit, even though I only read about them in the hotel brochure. But life was getting better. Daniela worked at New England Medical Center. We bought our first car for 1200 bucks, Ford Escort, blue. And we rented one bedroom apartment in Malden. In June of 2000, our son Jovan was born. Beautiful boy with big brown eyes, and he was the best thing that happened to us. When he was only three months old, one morning around six o'clock, he started to cry, and then he just stopped breathing. He was too small and, and, and started to turn blue. I panicked, I didn't know what to do. I called 911, an ambulance took him to the hospital. Fear of losing a child was the worst fear I ever felt. Something was wrong with our son. Several episodes followed and his condition had gotten worse. Next six months he spent in the intensive care, numerous tests, several surgeries, tracheostomy tube, and a very low chance of getting better. Johan was ventilator dependent, and with progressing illness that is going to leave him completely paralyzed. He was transferred to Franciscan Children's Hospital. It was our home for the next year. Fragile and in need of around the clock care, his transition home took some time to figure out. Finally, we had a plan. I'll find a job as a live-in superintendent in the apartment building and we can live where I work. A few months later, I'm at the interview for a live-in superintendent position at Mount Pleasant Apartments, an elderly housing community in Somerville. The first interview went well, but I never mentioned my son's illness. I was afraid to be disqualified. After the second interview, I was offered a job, and Mount Pleasant became our home for the next three years. Free apartment and $13 an hour were not a bad deal for someone in my position. But I wanted more for Jovan and Daniela. So I started to do construction work on the side, working most evenings and weekends. I worked all the time. We wanted to buy a house. And we slowly started to save for a down payment. In 2004, we bought our first home in Peabody. We got qualified for no income, no asset subprime loan. And with the help of predatory lender, our mortgage was approved. The house was in disrepair, then it looked horrible. Daniela wasn't sure whether to be happy or desperate about it. After six months of renovation, uh, often working until midnight, we were ready to move in and I was ready to leave my job at Mount Pleasant. It was extremely difficult to refinance the home and avoid losing it, but somehow we made it work. Same year, I founded Sigma Pros, a company that over the next 16 years renovated over 10,000 apartments from New York to Boston. We introduced high-speed occupied renovation and became reliable partner to many large real estate companies. My goal to build a company where everyone can excel and feel proud of the work they do was becoming a reality. Six months ago, COVID-19 started to spread globally at the alarming speed. 
And I had a feeling it's going to affect all of us in so many different ways. Our occupied renovation contracts were canceled. We had to send all of our employees home for the time being. And our business model didn't work anymore. And it needed to change. I still don't know what it is and what to do next. But I know I'm grateful for my wife, Daniela, the strongest woman I know. My son, Jovan, who taught me more about life than I can ever teach him. My team that stuck with me during these challenging times. And I know that overcoming our challenges makes us who we are. And this is just one of them. Thank you. I'm standing at the first checkpoint on the way to visit my family farm for the first time since we left. Well, it's actually not the first time because since the age of 13, we returned and left many times as the fight for land began in Zimbabwe. This land reform was aptly called the fast track land reform because of the haphazard way that it was conducted. And the violence and political motivations that were seen to be part of it. Unfortunately, it, it was suspected that it wasn't for the poverty alleviation and, and righting the historical wrongs as had been portrayed to us in the media. But thus began our journey of leaving our home. My goal was to go back to the farm and see my Gogo, Winnie. Gogo is a, a term we affectionately use for a nanny or housekeeper, but she was so much more than that to me. I had had many sleepless nights since arriving in Australia, thinking of all the many things I wish I'd said to her and explained, especially remembering back to that morning before we flew out in a house in Harare, this beautiful hug and lots of tears my teenage brain couldn't work out why we couldn't just take Winnie with us because she was part of the family. But obviously Australian immigration didn't see that. And since then I had thought of the many things I could have and would have said, things that only became apparent when arriving in Australia and having worked with refugees and understanding so much more, even understanding that we as a family could have applied for refugee status. But we were quite lucky in that fact that my mum was a nurse and so we got accepted into Australia, having the right skills and in a sense, the right language. We were preferred candidates for the country. Yet so many people like Winnie got left behind to face, continue to face the political and economic uncertainty. Many would say Zimbabweans are more economic or political and um, economic or livelihood refugees. But it, it does pose the question that I was faced with that many, there's many that there's a gap that it doesn't, um, that the refugee convention is, is missing. As we began the journey down the old familiar farm roads, a sense of nostalgia filled me, returning to and from school. And uh, but seeing the, the land now, it was so full of life and abundant because there hadn't been the, the manicuring that the farm farmers would do on the sides of the roads. Even the roads were falling away and it took us twice as long to get there. I was preparing myself for the, the view of of our, our lovely farmhouse up on the hill. But nothing could have prepared me as I looked up and, and saw the, my old home in ruins from a fire that had swept through and burnt it, a lovely thatch house. That despair and floods of tears was replaced by the joy of seeing the jacaranda trees that my dad had planted up the driveway, a vision that he'd had when I was born of planting them so that they would create a beautiful avenue for the day that I got married. Now the jacarandas created a beautiful purple carpet all the way up the driveway. 
as we drew, drew, we drew, drove up and turned to the right to go towards the farmhouse so I could visit my grandparents' graves, which were in the garden, only to be greeted by a bunch of young men all holding farm implements, looking extremely angry. My chaperone decided to do a quick U-turn and we headed towards the compound to find Winnie. Again, that sense of awe at how beautiful the land looked, all wild and contrasted with my memory of, of what the farm had been like. As we came up to Winnie's house, I saw Michael, one of my dad's old farm workers, and he had a huge smile on his face as he recognized me instantly. But a sense of panic came into my heart as I looked and couldn't see Winnie in her familiar spot outside her kitchen hut. And I wondered if she died, if I was too late, if with all the political difficulties and the, the violence that was directed towards farm workers who worked for white farmers, uh, this panic set in. But Michael jumped in the truck saying he would take us to Winnie. And it wasn't an ease of, of pain, it was actually more of a, a need to get to her as quickly as possible in case we were kicked off again in the interim and I just wouldn't get to see her and tell her the things that I had wanted to express of how much she'd meant to me and, and my family. So as we, we headed towards the field, Michael began to explain to us how they had had to be working in the field to pay rent in order to stay in their houses. Something that many Zimbabweans have been plagued with of, of right and wrong and um, who's the victims and the villains in our situation where many of us have been felt like we were political pawns in a, a very difficult game. As we arrived to the potato field, Michael shouted out for people to call Ambuya Winnie to come. And we were separated by a fence. And I was just taking in the familiar sights of the farm. And I looked up and saw Winnie shouting, Amai Tasha, Amai Tasha, as she must have thought I was my mother. And I was looking for a way to get through the fence, really faced with the <laughs> reminder that I wasn't the young farm girl I used to be. You know, the barbed wire fence held me back, but also this feeling that I could be trespassing as this was no longer our land. As Winnie arrived, he climbed through nimbly for a 70 something lady. And we embraced in this beautiful hug, hug that I remembered from that awful day when we left. And we were both just in floods of tears crying. And Winnie was just saying, thanks God, my Tasha, thanks God you're okay. You remembered me, thanks God. And I just couldn't believe that she was thanking God that I was okay when I felt like we had been the ones who deserted her and left her in this food insecure and, and, and violent context. And I had this deep sense of understanding of, of how much she'd influenced my life of who I was and how my simple faith that had guided me through the first few years in Australia had really come through her. And as I stepped back and looked around, I. I saw all the other farm workers who gathered round and not a dry eye around everyone really impacted by this show of, of love and reunification. I will always remember that hug. Although my friend did manage to get a beautiful photo of it that my brother then painted into a lifestyle painting, which we actually don't have the original anymore because he sold it in an exhibition as a, another family was so moved by it and, and it likened to their experiences in a similar forced removal situation. In essence, the historical wrongs have been created through the land reform, but what it's left is, is a people, a lot of poverty and a lot of pain as people have realized that the new and old farmers are not the enemy that we were used as political pawns. And now the aim is to try and reunify
reunify our country and, and rebuild in amongst a lot of political and economic uncertainty. But I'm so glad and grateful that now I get to visit Winnie regularly and, and maintain that connection to the land as she remains on the farm. And I go and collect her to take her to doctor's appointments. And when I do, I visit the new owners and I'm slowly developing a, a relationship with them with the hope that sometime soon they'll, they'll let me in to see my grandparents' graves to pay respects for my parents who haven't yet had the courage to visit yet. I grew up in Syria. We had very nice life and safe life. So, first I remember we was living in small house. It was me and my sister. Uh, I think we was like five years old. Uh, it was small house, nice house. It just was one room. We was like living with my mom, and my father, and my, my mother in the same room. And when we my mom had more kids, so we had to change the room, uh, the house, and rent a bigger house. Actually, every every one year we had to 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 change the house. Yeah, like rent another house. Finally, we rent big house. It was nice, and we had. I made a lot of friend there in my new house. Like we had very nice neighbor neighbor. After my father saved um, some money from his job, uh, finally we bought a house. We was very excited because after like 15 years, 15 years of renting house, we bought like house for us. It was very exciting. And because my father was a, my father a carpenter, so he furniture, he, he did all the furniture for house and we he did all the house by his hand and we was we was kids but we was helping him even like because i like blue color so he paint all my room blue even all the house all the kitchen blue i was so exciting because like i get like the house on like the color i like it was very exciting um when i like grew up, I was going to school and everything was normal in my country. Uh, suddenly, one day we were sitting watching the news. Just we saw in the news, they talking about uh, city. It's in Aleppo, uh, not in Aleppo, in Syria, but in different place. Like it's far, it's far from, uh, from Aleppo. Uh, one kid wrote in the, in the, in the hall, in the street. Uh, we don't want the president. We want, like, we want freedom. The police, the next day, when the police saw that writing, uh, they took the, the kids and they hurt the kids. For example, they cut the fingers. They, like, they hurt, they hurt the kids very badly. Uh, we was very sad. I didn't imagine, like, Oh my God, he's just a kid because I was like 13, 14 years old. I get scared even like if that happened to me or to my one of my brothers, what we gonna do? The days went and the police, like when the people in, the, in that city, people see how the police doing, how the police hurting the people, if they say like freedom or, if they want, if they don't want the, the president. So the people start protesting in that city. They don't want the president. They want the freedom. We was watching that in the TV, but we don't know what is, it's gonna going on because it's scary, you know? And after like, in Aleppo, it was normal, like, it it was it happened it like take for a couple months, and I was going normal to school. My brother, my father was working. Uh, the first things happened in Aleppo. Uh, I went to school one day, and my school is far away from my home, so I was taking bus to went there. 
uh, we was in the in the normal classroom. We was taking like the lesson. Suddenly we we see the police came in the in the classroom, and they took the teacher because she was saying like something about the president. I was so scared. I just was like fourteen. I I didn't know what to do. Like the whole school, it's full of police and everyone like screaming, yelling. I didn't know what to do. I just sit down under the table, and I called my my father. I told him, please come take me because I don't know what to do. He come and took me, took me home. Actually, that day it was the last day, like going to school. He come and took me home. From that day, start everything start in my country, like protesting. The people start protesting in the street, and it was very scary. The school stopped and everything stopped. And actually, we just moved in my new house, and we had neighbors like uh, neighbors and friends and um, actually I want to say one story about my neighbor uh, she she like get married uh, when I was like that age 14 and she had uh, her, her baby like first baby and uh, we was taking care of the baby all the time when she goes shopping and do stuff um, and after that, because like the protesting happened in Syria, so in uh, in my country, the people like got two part, part love, like part want the president and part of the people doesn't want the president. And they start shooting each other. If one people see, oh, that guy didn't like the, like he don't want the president, they 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 kill them. Uh, we were scared, actually, like one happened in my street, but we couldn't go anywhere because where are we gonna go? Like no choice, we had to stay at home. Actually, after a couple of weeks, uh, the bomb start in my country the president side and the other side start bombing each other and even the school get closed but i had to do my my last year of school like to get to the college so i just bought books and i was studying at home even like no school but you can do it by yourself like i just bought the, the I just bought the books and I was studying at home. So one day I was at home, I was studying. My brother was playing. Actually I have five, I have three brothers and one sister. And my mom was cooking. Even we didn't have electricity at home, but I was studying at the, like the gas light. And my father went outside to buy, to buy a, to buy bread for us, like something to eat because everything gets closed and it was very hard to find even bread to eat. I was studying, and suddenly I heard like very noisy sound, and I just look around. All my room it's full in the smoke. I I don't know what happened. I I was like. Oh my God, what's going on? And all we run to the kitchen, to my mom, we hug her, what is going on? And everything, it's break in my, in my room. And I just heard people yelling and because my house, it was first floor. So everyone getting to my house. And just, I heard my neighbor, she say, when my son, I lost my son, and she just came 
she was like, oh my God, I'll like blood. She say my son died. Really, I, I couldn't believe like what I'm gonna do, like what I'm thinking about. Uh, we was, we was there like, and we get scared, like afraid. Like we even we couldn't uh, breathe because the smoke, you couldn't believe like it's all chemical and. So we just hugged my mom and we was like yelling, where my father, where my father. We didn't know if my father, his life or no. Um, my father was coming at home and he had like some, some vegetables, some bread. Uh, one of the people, they told him, your home come bomb. And he didn't believe how to get home. He threw everything in the floor. He just ran, ran, ran to the house. And uh, when we saw him, I don't know what, what I feel. Like, may, I felt like I was crying. Like, I, I, I'm happy or I'm scared. I, I couldn't express my, my feeling because I saw my father, he's alive. Actually, we hugged him. And my father said, we cannot stay here. We have to leave. The last lot of things I did, I just look around in my room. I didn't see any blue color. All the blue color, it's gone. You know, it's break and the smoke everywhere. We just get get out from home. It was last. It was last day I saw my home. So we had to run. Even like we cannot take like any, no cars outside. So we have to run in the street. And my father told us, okay, we're gonna run to my grandmother's house. Even it's far, like one hour. He said, just run. And we was together, but my father said, if one of us die or one of us get shot, don't, don't, don't look around. Because if we get, if we went to help them, we're gonna die too. Actually, after one hour of running, Thanks God, everyone was safe. We went to my grandmother's house. We was there for like a couple months, but it get worse in that part too. So we all had to leave to the village. And like, we just had a home in, in, in like in the, in the city, we didn't have in the village. So we had to live with my, my grandmother's house. Um, that house, it was just three rooms, one living room, and imagine eight, eight family, we was living together without electricity and without gas, without water. We had to go and take the water uh, from far away and just for drink water. It's, it was very hard time. Even when we have to sleep, like all the kids in one room and all the women in one room, if you want to go like drink water, you have to step to the kids to dump, to dump a pass in, in like a person. Actually, after, after all that, I was studying. When I went, my books, it was with me. Even like I live with all that family, uh, I was going outside like for walk, you know, the village. So I was walking and I take my books, I was studying. And no one believed like, uh, really everyone like the war and everything and I was studying. But I don't know, it was my dream to complete my study. So actually I did the exam and I passed but I couldn't register for the, the college because um, of the war. Uh, and if you want to register for college, you have to go to the, to the, like to Aleppo. And I was in the village, I couldn't go. So they didn't accept me in, in the university, even I have like very good grades. But when, when that happened, my father say, oh, I cannot live in Syria anymore. 
because like no school and my father lost his job and we didn't have enough like have enough money to leave everything like we had war but every everything it was expensive even you have to buy a water even you have to buy a gas to to cook so we decided to go to turkey um that was hard too when we went to turkey because we didn't have any any pass, passport or we could like we couldn't go with passport so we have to go from syria to turkey by the border and one day my father said okay we're gonna go we cannot take anything with us even clothes even food any nothing so we went there at five in the morning we went in the border but the the man he was with us he said oh you um we have one way to go but it's very hard but we had to do it you know so that way it was very hard because we walk nine hour even the way you have to know where to where to step because if you step in like wrong way you're gonna die you know so we went there before we walk we just saw one man he just stepped in the bomb and he died like it's like 200 feet from us oh my god we was so scary but actually we got we did it after nine hour we went to turkey and it was different life so we live in turkey like three years and after we apply to to come like to go out without to go out uh, from turkey because we had just to work no future there so even we didn't we couldn't go to school because we didn't know the language and like they didn't accept the syrian like syrian kids in the school so we decided to go outside we apply uh, for iun like international so we apply to come uh, like anywhere actually when we get accepted uh we didn't know where we, where they they were they're gonna talk took us um they say america so at that moment i get scared and my mom too but my father say okay we're gonna go but actually we we didn't want to come because you know the social media how they talk about oh america and because i'm actually a muslim people um it was a hard decision but actually we came here and we arrived here in 2016. Um, at the beginning, it was hard because we didn't speak any English. So my English was, was zero. So I had to learn English. Uh, actually, now I'm living in Lowell, Massachusetts. I have, I have a good life. I am studying, I'm in college. All my brothers now, they are in college. Uh, I'm driving. <laughs> it's very excited because I couldn't do it in my country. And um, I living in in a nice house, actually, because I did all my room blue here too, like blue blanket, even the wall I painted blue, blue flowers. It was hard time, but I'm here, and thank you. Well, I want to welcome our brave, amazing storytellers to join me. If you are a storyteller, please turn on your video, your audio. 
And if you are, oh, Zainab, you're in the blue room. <laughs> if you are a, uh, a viewer, um, this would be a great time to use your Q&A feature and maybe send some love, something that resonated with you in the stories, something that you learned, any comments. It, is, uh, it takes a lot of bravery as a storyteller to get up and share your life with others. Um, and I know as someone who performs, it's also nice to know, like, are they out there when you're on a virtual show? I mean, usually people are on stage, but um, a huge clapping to all of you for telling your stories. Uh, I know Anna's gonna jump on in a second. Oh, see, you're already getting some love. <laughs> Amazing, each one. Um, oh, good, we've got some questions too, so I don't even have to wait, but let's, uh, let's let Anna join, Anna join. One, two, three, okay, we're good. Um, actually, the first question is very similar to what I was going to ask. Um, Natasha and Zainab, just make sure your audio, put your audio on so we can hear yourself. Uh, she says, Rosemary says, wow, these stories are amazing, each and every one. I could not agree more. I'm wondering if the storytellers would be willing to speak to why they wanted to share their stories. What were your motivations besides me calling you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who wants to go first? Ada? Uh, my motivation is to keep, um, well, mostly to honor the sacrifice of uh, the older generation um, by telling the story. And this is an era where we have you know, record numbers of refugees, uh, displaced people, and I wanted to to especially try to bring attention to the very young and the very old in those groups. I feel like those voices are kind of quieted in the hubbub and children don't always tell you um, what, what they're really experiencing. And so that was what I hoped to accomplish with, with the story. And Anna, you actually, um, one thing that's important to you are these letters, correct? Um, yes. <laughs> Tell us about how you're incorporating their words into your memoir. I actually use, I, here's one of the letters. Oh, um, good. Maybe you can see that it's very, very thin. Oh. Uh, um, I have actually, well, most of these letters are now, you know, copies. I have the originals separate because they really just fall apart. Uh, but I actually uh, use the words from the letters. Of, of the women going back and forth, um, the actual phrases to capture um, the kinds of messages and just the, 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 the depiction of life at, at, as the years went by after the revolution is fascinating um, to, to watch. It's a, it's a or you really, I feel like I'm watching it when I, when I read their words. That's how we feel like when we're listening to your stories. Uh, Natasha, Zena, Boya, somebody want to jump in about why you shared your story? Yeah, I can say. So, from the first month I came, I heard a lot of people talking about Syrian people. They are terrorists. Why they do? Why why they are here? What they doing here? And a lot of things, but no one know what each of us or or every person get through. And like we just want safe place to live in and like just like looking for future right? you know and like this story act really i all the time i say that it's it's not just my story it's it's everyone's story every syrian people's story and you have shared it i mean over and over again and for me it just keeps getting bigger and bigger which i love because i know more about it um how did you feel the first time you shared it compared to how it is for you now um like all, all the time like the emotion different because like all the time i say thanks god i'm here i'm safe all my family safe yeah and it was hard at the beginning like to tell everyone but I want everyone to know like what we get through. Yeah. 
And your family, I mean, uh, I think all of us resonate with different stories. My father is an architect and when I was born, he bought our house and he did all the work on our house himself. And so for me and you, I just, I, on, I immediately feel a connection and at the same time in complete awe of you. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't speak more Arabic than I did four years ago, um, but it's, you're just, you're amazing Zainab. Um, Voya, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why did you say your, share your story? Well, I think one of the, re one of the reasons is to uh, be an inspiration to other immigrants. Uh, and at the same time, to show people that take immigrants into their communities, uh, that every person matters. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. And, and you contribute to society in so many different ways. So. And you said to me that you, I mean, you purposely even hire as an immigrant business owner, you purposely go out and say like, you know, work with me. Um, is that, is that part of your, I mean, your mission? Yeah, well, <laughs> in a way, I guess, but it's, it's, it's important to, uh, to share the stories so people can, can relate to each other, whether they are natives or refugees or immigrants we all need to f recognize the value in each one of us. And that's, that's why I wanted to share. When we were talking about what you should include your story, I, 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 if you don't mind me sharing, I, when, you told, when you told me the part about smoking in the back of the business with these guys, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you were like, I shouldn't tell them that. And I was like, oh my God, like, I think we say like, you know, integration is a process, but we don't actually talk about like, what does that look like? What does it mean to learn English? What does it mean to find work? And I was like, of course, that makes complete sense. And I it love the humor. Does. It <laughs> does. My first uh, connections, my first friendships were behind the buildings with the co-workers. I mean, yeah. I, I never met it before. We just... We just I mean, this is not an endorsement of smoking. But no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not an endorsement of finding people and just like looking around and connecting with people. Um, exactly, yeah. Boya, this conference is about integration. Um, what made it easier for you besides learning the language mm -hmm. to connect with your neighbors? I mean, you've been really proactive in this way. No, I wasn't shy to go out and talk to people. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the key. Um, my first neighbors, uh, I introduced myself very quickly and some of them showed some interest to hear my story, but we, we connected on a very simple human level and i think the more we talk the more we understand each other absolutely now natasha <laughs> as you wipe your eyes because it's two o'clock in the morning in zimbabwe <laughs> 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 uh, you know that's dedication to storytelling uh why do you share your story and was this new for you actually i guess i don't even know if this was the storytelling style was new for you um no, uh, actually, great question. I, I suppose I actually, that's why when we were trying to find a story, I wasn't going to talk about finding Winnie um, because I've told it before, uh, but in a newspaper article in the, um, and in another, in a, the Africa magazine. And I suppose my motivation was to begin that sort of um, understanding between black and white, especially, um, and to show the love that existed across the racial boundaries and socioeconomic boundaries and um, that that had divided our country for so long. Um, so that was my original. But then there's also the, the selfish point um, of healing. It provides healing. Yeah. Um, and every time you tell it, you you get new insights about um, what it meant and, and what it means to, to the country as well. Yeah. Right. And I know that some people today that attended the conference know about your work and your research in this area. But for those just tuning in tonight, tell people about what you do now. I mean, you've taken it beyond just your own personal life. This is your part of your career and to build re reconciliation. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I suppose I, I was very lucky to do the, the Tufts research on return migration. It really motivated me in um, exploring it myself uh, a lot more when you have something to an academic pursuit to write about um, that keeps you pushing through the, the pain and sometimes the hard learnings um, but yeah so I'm I'm here and we're in the process of trying to set up um, 
some integrate like spaces for integration within Harari. Um, I partnered up with a couple of different organisations, and so um, yeah, I was talking about one of them is in a marketplace in Imbari to do an art project um, to try and create those spaces, and we're also doing a, a children's museum that that used to be here, but again the the the, the two doctors that set it up originally, um, which got closed down, unfortunately, um, their heart was also that was to create spaces where young kids can come and 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 be together and families interact in the, in the way they're learning. Um, and we can also start incorporating art and history and and, and things that we really lack here. Mm, that's fantastic. Um, you and Anna share an interest in writing, it turns out. Um, Anna, you're working on this book. Um, can you speak a little bit about your integration experience? You were resettled to New Hampshire from Cuba, very different environment. Um, what lessons did you learn in your experience? Uh, well, well, we were so such a rare oddity uh, <laughs> that... Um, it, it was impossible not to integrate in some way because people were very curious about us. I think when you become part of a community of immigrants that's much larger, you can see people might have preconceived notions, right, of what, what this community is like, and then they're not, there's, there's this divide. But mostly people were very curious. Now, there, we did have our problems, and there were some difficult people. Um, but for the most part, I got to give it up to Nashua, New Hampshire in 1967 because those people um, really opened up their arms to us for the most part. Um, my mother and my aunt decided when they came here that they were not going to school in a large Cuban American. There were, well, large is relative. Um, they passed Miami over and they passed um, different towns and um, cities in New Jersey over because they really wanted to make a new life. Mm -hmm. and, and their feeling was, yes, we, we have lost our country, we've lost whatever we have had of value, um, but we're not gonna look at life as exiles. We're mm -hmm. gonna make a new life here. And so from the very beginning, which is different than, than a, a good chunk of Cuban Americans at the time, because the, the belief was that Castro would fall. Mm -hmm. um, that you know you couldn't the United States could, wouldn't possibly allow um, a, a communist state um, at 90 miles from its shore. So, but my mother and my aunt had decided we're here and we're here for good. So, um, as far as integration and and how we 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 dove in, you know, children are amazing, and they are a big bridge. Um, to the community, you know, through school and through their play. Um, so um, the integ integrating part of it, the assimilation part of it, was was a conscious decision on one side, and then a natural evolution on the other side. Um, but as assimilated as I am, as I feel I am, there's no question that almost every few days something happens that reminds me, I wasn't born here. Uh -huh. I, I'm not from here. Um, and when I returned to Cuba, there was nothing like going to a place where people look like you, um, mm -hmm. they, they, they talk like you, they, it, and it was a sense, of course, I didn't belong there either, you know, because uh -huh. I, I had left when I was so young, but it was a, 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 a big surprise to me that this felt, that felt like home, like I had a, a claim to it. And I've yeah. never felt that I had a claim, like that kind of a claim to the United States. So I don't know yeah. if I answered the question. No, it's, uh, I mean, actually, Natasha, that's what you study is this idea of home. Like what is home? Mm -hmm. And uh, is it geography? Is it a feeling? Is it both? Um, do you want to say a couple of words on that? And then I'll, uh, uh, Zainab and Voya, if you want to think about either what helped you integrate or what is home for you, please feel free. But Natasha, tell us a little bit about that study. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I suppose the, the complexities of, of home and, and the understandings. And when I was in Japan, I, I came up to, I came to this con concept of furusato, which is like the, your traditional home or your, um, and so many people would ask, where's your furusato? And it was, 
the same concept that we have in Zimbabwe, which is like your kumusha, which is where you come from, the land that you generated from, and that that soul heart connection that exists. Um, and I just found it so interesting for migrants and especially for refugees or people that can't return back. Um, is then how home the concept of home can change and whether it has to be a physical place, the people that's involved you know whether it's about the people and the relationships um and and exploring that that whole concept and the difficulties sorry the dogs are going mad this is very um, it's very a current event <laughs> so this is home <laughs> I, well, right this is home we're all at home boya can you speak to what home is for you well i guess the home is where you feel the most comfortable uh to be and it's Boston now. Mm -hmm. The home is uh, is here. Yeah. I, I mean, still you have strong connection with uh, with where I come from, of course, like we all do. But after a certain time, you you start a life and you and you put an anchor someplace, uh, and and that's what feels at home. When I'm flying back to Boston, I'm I'm coming home. Mm. I mean, but like Anna, Anna uses her writing, but you also use arts as a way to bring your home from Bosnia here. Um, yes. Was that was that something you did from the beginning, or has that been something you've sort of brought in over time? I, I didn't have uh, time or means to do it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that changed, you know. The, uh, but it, it definitely shows a strong connection with uh, with, with the Balkans, with the place. Mm -hmm that I grew up and uh, that I visit often. And so many of my friends and family lives there. So yeah, that is home too. Mm -hmm. But my intimate connection and, and what is home for me is, is, is basically landing at Logan. Uh, I'm, I'm coming home. Zainab, how about you? You're the most recent arrival. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So actually it's it's hard to say what what it's home for us because like we live in syria and like we grew up there but i think the home it's when you feel yourself yourself safe mm -hmm. and like you can do what you want mm -hmm. and like your voice you can say like what you want to and yeah, and you've had quite a platform. Um, I, I, I will never forget the day CNN rolls into our office to interview you. And I just thought, like, <laughs> this is crazy. You're on the front page of the CNN um, being interviewed, speaking on behalf of Syrians. Um, you are a very driven women, woman and you've always had big dreams. What are your dreams now? My dream, my dream, I, I don't know, maybe now I, like I'm doing computer science, like to to do, uh, like to be a programmer, and to help my parents. Mm -hmm. Like now I'm helping them to, like, learn English. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. For now, yes. For now, <laughs> that's that's plenty to have on your plate. So, uh, we have a question from an audience member. They said, "What is one thing?" you would like people to know about immigration or refugees? One thing they may not know already. This is like the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha, I'm throwing it to you. <laughs> I'll keep it up, yeah. <laughs> Um, the first thing that jumps to mind for me is, and it's always been very similar, is that that the human experience um, is so similar. Uh, like when we, um, when I would work with case management with refugees in Australia, it was amazing how the stories and the emotions were all so so similar, um, even though the experiences were completely different and the levels of trauma and, and conflict. Um, that you're coming from but so many of them are similar and when you so that's the power of the storytelling is that people can relate even to the tiniest little little part and I, I think that that human experience is, is powerful for connecting people across that. Thanks yeah. Natasha. <laughs> what kind of dog is it? Let's just ask. What, what do you have for a dog? 
uh, well, the it's Steffi that is <laughs> and a Labrador that's outside. Oh, somebody else? <laughs> Playing <Anna>? so loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was just going to say that um, I think most refugees um, that we struck, well, former refugees struggle to hang on to the sense of home in some way. And that that's an ongoing thing that doesn't really go away. It's sort of like a an effort that you make uh, to, and not all will be like this. I mean, sure. I think there are people, uh, human beings, there are human beings who are forward march. My mother, always, <laughs> always facing the future. My father wasn't. My father was always facing the past. Mm but not in, in a morbid way of, about loss and all of that, although he did, he would go in that direction. Um, recreating that, basically recreating a world through mm -hmm. stories, through the act of, of helping each other remember. Do you remember this? I used to draw maps to show them that I remembered the neighborhood. Oh. And, and, and I would say, and so-and-so lived here, and they would love to know that I remembered. You know, I was six. And, but, but that's also the point is that even little kids, um, there's so much going on in a young child's mm. head and they don't have the words to tell you. And um, I, I think that that's worth exploring more. Um, if you wanna know refugees, I mean, assuming that you, you think they're comfortable talking about their, their story. Um, I know our family loved telling other, uh, you know, Americans our story. Although a lot of Americans thought that in Cuba, you know, people swung from ropes in the jungle. And, right. You know, there were no cars or they just didn't get it. Um, it's different today because there's more, um, you know, uh, coverage and right. people are more connected. But I think, I don't know. I mean, that's a question for the other tellers too. It's, well, we're obviously telling our story, but in general, were you open with your stories and, and sharing? them with other people. I know I'm excited to read your book, which uh, is tentatively called Radio Big Mouth, hopefully will be when it's in paperback. Um, but partly because you talk about your father's stories and how entertaining this gentleman is. I haven't met him, but I feel like I'm excited to. He's got like 42 canaries, something very popular in Cuban culture. Is that right? And he has them in the basement. Yeah. I <laughs> don't tell anybody. I just love it. I can't wait. I can't wait to read it. But um, uh, before we wrap up, Boya, um, what, what is one thing you want people to understand? It can happen to you. Yeah. It can happen to you. No matter who you are, no matter where you're born, you can become a refugee tomorrow. Just think about that. At our first refugee show in Concord in 2017, we had a gentleman, you saw him in the opening, um, right? Um, ride from Iraq and he told a story about being a doctor and he was in Baghdad and he said honestly I had a wife I had a baby I was being a doctor I, I, I knew there were refugees I knew there was conflict but I was just going to work exactly. and and then overnight his life was threatened because he stood up and said I'm not going to let somebody cut in line for one of my patients and he said you know now I'm here everything has changed so it it's a anyway. That's... right right uh, Zainab one thing you'd love us uh -huh. to all know I think like refugee uh, struggle a lot to be like like people where they live with like and like learn the language and like just to just to be confident like in the country where they live. Um, that's I I, <laughs> I have never lived the experience, but I've heard many similar stories. So you're absolutely right. Um, I love stories. I could talk to you all night long. Uh, we have to get Natasha to bed because now it's three o'clock in the morning in Zimbabwe. Um, but I want to thank our guests that signed in tonight. Um, it is one thing to share your story. It's another thing to have someone hear it. So without an audience, we would not be able to produce suitcase stories. So um, before you sign off, if there's any story that particularly touched you, please put it in the Q&A, make a comment. Um, it's good for us to hear. But also, if you are somebody that has a shift story, and if you sit within three feet of me, everybody knows I'm going to make you tell a story. So uh, um, I think that all of us can do more to share these kinds of stories. Um, sometimes they're funny. Sometimes they're serious. Sometimes they're all of it, like Voya's. <laughs> um, but I want to thank our storytellers so much for sharing your lives with us. Um, we are better for it. 
and thank you to the listeners and thank you to Refugees and Towns Project for having suitcase stories. Um, I'm going to put a slide up to close out. Um, if you want to be in touch and tell your story with suitcase stories, we have many opportunities. You can reach out to me and I can connect you and have you share your story. But for now, I hope you come back tomorrow. There is a full day of events on the Arts Festival with Refugees and Towns, um, including from Zainab's new home, uh, the Encore Dance Project has one of their workshops. So have a wonderful evening. Good night. And thank you, everybody.